we are delighted this evening to, to have uh, Dr. Caroline Pennett with us. Um, she is a senior lecturer, lecturer in international history at the University of Sheffield, and she specializes in Mesoamerican and, and Mesoamerica rather, sorry, and the Atlantic world. Um, she is the UK's only Aztec historian, so we are very, very lucky to, to have her with us this evening. Um, and her first book, Bonds of Blood, Gender, Life Cycle and Sacrifice in Aztec Culture, was published in 2008 and actually won the Royal Historical Society's Gladstone Prize for History in 2008. Um, Caroline's new book, which you can scan, if you scan the QR code, it will take you to where, the place where you can buy it right now uh, and pre-order it. Uh, Caroline's new book is called On Savage Shores, uh, How Indigenous Americans Discovered Europe. And it shows us or tells us a groundbreaking history of how native peoples from the Americas crossed the Atlantic and transformed the world after 1492. And that's going to be published, as we said earlier, um, upcoming in, in January 2023, which is very, very exciting. Dive on and, and pre-order that now. Um, but as discussed, um, th this evening is, is more a, a chat, really, an opportunity for you to pose any questions that you might have. And you can see loads flying in already. That's great. I know lots of people teach the Aztecs at GCSE, and especially it's quite a popular topic at A-level. So now really is the opportunity um, to ask those questions. What we have asked um, Caroline initially to do, though, is just kind of give a brief introduction to her and her work, um, particularly um, across her, her two published books or one of them upcoming. Um, so, Caroline, I'm going to shut up and I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Are you going to make my head bigger or are we going to look at the screen? Um, or <laughs> Not that I don't want people to be able to pre-order now and all this kind of thing. Uh, and also, apparently, the chat is working now. Um, so uh, people can can use that too. Excellent. Thank you. Hello. Um, it's quite strange not being able to see people, isn't it? So please forgive me. I, it's nice to be able to see at least some people. Uh, I don't know how many of you during COVID did the teaching to the black screen of death where they all have the cameras off. Um, but at least I can see Janice and Sam, which is nice. Um, so I started as a historian of the Aztec world um, and I started as a gender historian. And so when I started my PhD, it was all about trying to understand Aztec gender. And by the time I got to it being a book, it was about trying to understand how the Aztecs could commit human sacrifice without being dehumanized by it. So that's where I started, really, is as a historian of gender and of violence, um, because it always really intrigued me that you have this culture that are so in many ways by modern standards sophisticated, they have kind of relative gender equity, women inherit property and power, you can't go around beating your wife, um, they have universal education for boys and girls, they are in some ways such, they, you know, they love their kids, they're, they write poetry, and yet they're committing sacrificial violence. And that juxtaposition for me was really, really fascinating. And so that's why I started studying it. And, and it grew from there really um and so a lot of my earlier work is on uh questions around gender and violence and the Aztecs specifically and then I started doing global and comparative histories so I was part of the global middle ages project thinking about the ways that indigenous people were part of a global world part of a, and how they can be comparatively as well as uh, connectively drawn into discussions about the rest of the world because very often people talk about Eurasia and they sort of leave the Americas off to the side even if they include Africa so we tend to get lost out of those early periods and also I think a lot of people don't think about the fact that the Aztecs are contemporary with Henry VIII people pigeonhole them as over here with the Romans and the Egyptians but actually they're quite a modern recent culture and in the when the Spanish invade, you can see that encounter between two societies, one that has felt quite ancient to us in some ways, but is actually really modern, and a society that we feel we're relatively familiar with the early modern period. And so I really found that fascinating. So I did a fair bit of comparative history and, and some stuff around that. And while I was doing that, 
I'd had this project that I'd been thinking about for a long time, which was why is it that we hear about Europeans traveling across the world, white men conquering and striding out all over the place, and we don't hear about indigenous people going the other way. And so I started looking for them and it turns out there are really loads of them, loads and loads of them. And so I started on this project that, that when I started working on it was going to be a book about indigenous Mexicans, Aztec Mexica people traveling to Europe. And then it just sort of grew until it became this big transnational popular history book, trying to tell a bigger story about, not just about those people, but about why they matter about how thinking about them can transform our view of this period of history. And I was lucky enough to meet an agent through a friend and, and it became a whole whole thing. <laughs> and that's what's coming out in January is this big public history project. Um, um, I'm trying to work out where I was going with that. So essentially, I have these kind of two streams of, of what I do. One is as an uh, Aztec historian and as a comparative historian. And the other is this newer bit of what I'm doing where I'm trying to think about indigenous histories more generally. So I know from the chat that quite a few people are here because of the Aztecs, but actually I've done things on other indigenous cultures. And I think there's a lot to be learned in talking about the Aztecs about how we teach indigenous histories more generally as well. Now, I don't know we don't do enough indigenous histories in Britain, um, but they do pop up here and there. I mean, one of the exam boards is in touch with me about how we might change one of the colonization modules to bring more indigenous peoples in. I know they've also been in touch with this as GCSE board, in touch with colleagues um, at Hull about how to change the way they talk about um, the peoples in the, the northeastern woodland peoples, which sounds like a description, but is actually the technical term, the northeastern woodland peoples uh, that the British encounter in the 1580s and so on. They didn't like it that those people told them they had to call them indigenous. Um, they were like, could we not say Native American? No, not really. We've moved on. from So terminology, things like that have moved on quite fast in terms of what's acceptable in the public space, I think, in the last 10 years. And it's sort of an exciting opportunity because suddenly there's all this appetite for telling different kinds of histories, which, I mean, we've always done that, right? So it was the great man history, and then it was history from below, and then it and women's history and cultural histories and queer histories and so on and black histories. And, and now, you know, I don't want to create the impression I'm the first person ever to have done this, because I am not the first person to have noticed Indigenous people traveling to Europe. It's just that None of that scholarly research seems to have made an impact on the way we in the public perceive that bit of history. So everybody knows about Henry VIII, but how many people know that Henry VIII met a Brazilian king? How many people know? So Golden Age Spain is one of the uh, A-level um, modules, or it, or it was uh, until relatively recently, I think. I'm not, I don't know if it's still current, but I, I know I've had re relatively recent students come through and talk about doing Golden Age Spain. Um, forgive me for not being up on they keep changing the curriculum very slightly like when a primary they did the Aztecs for ages and then one year it was just suddenly the Maya for no good reason and then all the teachers had to come up with new resources for no good reason because it's basically very similar um, I mean they're not exactly the same obviously they're different but it kind of teaches the same sorts of things and but everybody had to come up with new resources so sorry if if but anyway so people do Golden Age Spain, people do A-levels, do a bit of Golden Age Spain. But most people don't know, even if they've done an A-level in Golden Age, module in Golden Age Spain, that there are tens of thousands of indigenous people enslaved in Europe during that period. When we think about transatlantic slavery, we think about African peoples and peoples of African descent. We don't build indigenous peoples into that. It's almost a trope. Well, it is a trope that... Um, the uh, United States is built on black, this is the way it's always phrased in the US, black bodies and indigenous lands. And that's sort of literally true, but at the same time, it's also built on indigenous bodies and indigenous enslaved labor. And it's only in the last couple of decades that people have started to do work on that. And still those people, their experiences in the transatlantic world haven't really got 
into the popular imagination at all. Now that's of course not to diminish the transatlantic trade in African peoples at all. I mean, it becomes on a much larger scale, but it's very much part of the beginning. And even it seems like the same people who are trading African enslaved peoples West may well be bringing indigenous enslaved peoples East. It's all, they share experiences in Seville. We, we have records of them being alongside each other. It's, it's a shared story. And I think it's so important to talk about that. And so the work I'm doing, I, I think, builds as well as standing on the shoulders of colleagues who work on this, also builds on the work of people like David Olusoga and Olivetto Tele, who've started telling different kinds of stories about European histories, who've started making European history into a more diverse place in, in the popular imagination. And I think that's that's really important. I mean, it's ridiculous. You can't say, oh, did you know that there were black Romans without someone popping up to tell you that you're a mouthpiece for liberal fascism or whatever it is, who is rewriting history to suit a multicultural agenda. And you're like, but it's, it, well, I mean, think about the fuss over the Lord of the Rings. You can't have black people in fictional medieval worlds, let alone in, <laughs> you know, the real one. It's it's absolutely ludicrous. Anyway, I know a lot of people came to talk to me about the Aztecs. That is also something I do. They form a big part of the book. Their descendants travel, their descendant travelers as well, because they are so much um, part of that. My book focuses on the first hundred years or so of encounter before it goes up to the founding of Jamestown. Um, though I talk a bit about things that happen afterwards, that's the focus because it's that moment. Firstly, that's often neg neglected, and secondly, it's that moment when things are a little bit more in flux in the Atlantic, and Indigenous peoples have have more influence. Plus, it's it's where I started. You know, it's what I know about. But then I also go all the way down to the Tupi people and all the way up. To in Brazil, all the way up to the Inuit via the northeastern coast. Um, and of course, a lot of Caribbean people are part of this because they're the first people to encounter uh, Europeans. But then I'm like on Friday, I'm doing telly for Aztec stuff. You said I'm the UK's only Aztec historian. I should acknowledge one or two colleagues in archaeology, but I'm the only historian. I did have a PhD student, Harriet, uh, but she went off to do something different. She's not working in academia. So I continue to be allowed to call myself this. Um, as long as we respect disciplinary boundaries and just the historian, there are there's Elizabeth Baccadano um, in in London. Uh, she is an archaeologist. Um, but yeah, um, I feel like I could just keep talking, but maybe I shouldn't because I'm getting to the point where I'm rambling rather than I've probably forgotten something really vital about my career trajectory don't know what it is well hopefully some of the things that you're going to go on to say will come out through questions um so we're going to go to the, the the chat questions in a moment um but Janice I know that you've prepared some questions before um so if we start with if you'll indulge us if we'll start with one from the b -Bot history team and then we're going to go to the chat and we'll hopefully kind of flick between them yeah please do talk to me talk to us <laughs> Um, okay, where to start? Uh, thank you for that, by the way. That was that was really interesting. Um, so one question that came out of what you were, you were just talking about, um, you've sort of mentioned that Indigenous histories, especially in, in Europe, have been sort of neglected. I wondered whether that's something that you've seen sort of across your work with colleagues around the world or whether that's something that's kind of like a, an, an English phenomenon because I think mm. we in Britain are getting a bit better at telling the stories of black people and women and queer history but I do you know I, I don't know much about indigenous histories and I think is, is that something that's that you, you see around the world or is that kind of like a, an England thing? Well I, I can't I feel like this requires me to have a lot of expertise in other educational systems that I do not. Um, so the United States, of course, has taken this on more. Mm. But uh, and, and of course, because, of course, there are and Canada, of course, where there are and, and uh, in particular New Zealand, New Zealand, although things are far from perfect, there has led the way in terms of integrating indigenous Maori people into uh, 
putting them at the foreground of education, bringing them into the academy, setting up, uh, taking seriously um, indigenous ways of thinking and ways of doing science and so on. Um, the uh, Australia, by contrast, has not really. Um, the in the United States and Canada, there's been talk of reconciliation, but how and much in the United States, indigenous histories are taught varies wildly from state to state and from school to school, because of course, with a decentralized education system, I mean, Texas last year was still teaching from a school book that said in, uh, so I saw this on Twitter, um, that in the early modern period, I forget what the exact date was that they used, I think it's like 17th, 18th century, millions of Africans migrated to the Americas migrated right is that what they did yeah oh and someone's saying in Poland the topic is very neglected and I, I think it is true that or from what I've heard that that in many former imperial powers across Europe mm -hmm. the focus has not been as strong on the places that are being colonized as they are the people doing the colonizing and I think that's a broader problem than just indigenous histories yeah so I have students that are interested in history that come to university knowing about history that couldn't tell me what partition is mm. um the women's officer a few years ago at the um student union in sheffield uh she said to me she's of uh, pakistani descent and she said i don't understand this is your history as well as my history how can people not know about this but hardly anybody knows about it yeah. and so i think it, it's it's a broader problem than just indigenous histories. That said, I mean, in, in, sorry, did you want to say something? No, 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 no. Car I was just gonna say, that said, in, in Britain specifically, there's also a, a real, there's a lack of expertise. Um, there's a, a lack of depth of knowledge. I mean, people don't want to talk about, oh, somebody saying a current GCSE textbook talks about people working as slaves, which is a bit of a contradiction in terms, isn't it? Um, and it's, Sorry. Um, so in Britain, as I say, there are a few people who work on colonial histories in universities, but and there are indigenous peoples living in Britain. There were indigenous peoples very involved, for example, in the campaign to change the name of the Exeter Chiefs Rugby Club, um, where in the end they fudged it massively and didn't change the name, but changed the mascot and claimed there were indigenous chiefs in Exeter in the Stone, not the Stone Age. Do I mean the Iron Age? Like a, I forget. They they created some deep history for Exeter yeah. in which it's, it's Iron Age. It's oh, was it really silly? Yeah. I mean, it's just. I but and this is a place. Okay, if they'd come up with the name and that was the mascot and everything, right? Fine, fair enough. But they didn't. They had the tomahawk chop and all this sort of stuff as part of their imagery. So it was yeah. Mm. Mm. But there were a lot of indigenous people. I mean, a lot of sev several indigenous people who live in the UK, there are indigenous people living in the UK, there have been indigenous people here for 500 years, but there aren't large numbers of them. Um, and so the expertise and the pressure to teach these histories has not been what it should be, I think, where, of course, we have very large numbers of people of African and Asian descent. Uh, and so quite rightly, they've talked about representation of their histories being vital and that that has led the conversation mm. I mean representation for those native people whose children do live here is important but I think it's more about in most cases fairly and sensitively representing those histories and recognizing them as part of our colonial history as part of our imperial history as part of the oppression that Britain did in various places, um, but also as part of global history and as part of how we got to where we are as a world today with so many indigenous peoples around the world who are still on average oppressed, marginalized and disadvantaged by every single socioeconomic measure on average. Mm -hmm. Native people in the United States are more likely to be killed by the police than African Americans. And yet, and that's not, the Black Lives Matter movement is absolutely vital and 
rightly has taken centre ground. And in fact, there was prior to that um, a Native Lives Matter movement, um, which has had some people have called it Indigenous Lives Matter. And they deliberately stepped back from that because they felt it was right to centre Black Lives Matter at that time, the people who'd been involved with that movement. And the focus then has been on murdered and missing Indigenous women. Uh, and they put their energies into focusing on that in order to, to draw out the you know, the, these major issues uh, and, and not make it feel like they were trying to take attention away from Black Lives Matter, which would absolutely not have been the intention. Um, but they, nonetheless, um, Indigenous people are also very subject to state violence, to uh, children being put into care, taken away and put into care, to um, the uh, to being uh, imprisoned, for example. They're imprisoned at slightly uh, lower rates than people of African-American descent, slightly more likely, I think it is at the moment, to have the children taken and fostered. It's, you, and people, I mean, and the treatment of Aboriginal peoples in Australia has been utterly catastrophic. This is, people say, oh, should we really call what happens to Indigenous peoples a genocide? Well, you know, they're, paying in Australia at the end of the 19th century, they pay for the corpses of indigenous people. They're being murdered for money by the state. It's, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. they're attempting to wipe them out. And sorry, I've made this a bigger question, haven't I? And a yes. less um, jolly one than, I mean, it's a human sacrifice isn't a jolly subject, but <laughs> like people kind I'm of go, about oh, that for later. that's interesting. But where, when you start, down this trajectory obviously it becomes very dark very quickly but I do think this is part of why it really matters that we talk about it because it's it's part of where we are and how we got to where we are and it is a big part of imperial history and something that is often overlooked um in well much like people overlook all the discussion of slavery and the rush to teach about abolition or to talk about abolition um the treatment of indigenous peoples gets lost. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think, so we teach at our school, Janice and I teach in the same school, um, the GCSE Migration Through Time Unit, which actually your book sounds perfect for. So I'm yeah. going to pre-order it this evening. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> we, Thank you. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Um, but we've used, I don't know if you've, I'm sure you've come across the book in, I've forgotten who wrote it, um, but Indigenous London. Oh yeah, Cold um, Thrushes, amazing yeah. book. Um, fantastic. All by, and I highly recommend. Yeah, so we have used. I mean, the class, the obvious ones that we use are Wanchesi and Monteo. Oh, um, they're in my book as well. Yeah. Great. Um, the um, but also we teach in near Brentford, um, so obviously Pocahontas was here. Um, so for our students to kind of center it, um, center it on a local figure. Yeah. Who also connects them to indigenous culture and indigenous life in in, yeah. in North America is is an, a wonderful opportunity. And yeah. we have had lots of questions um, coming and I, in. I, I just feel I, I'm bound to point out because we're talking about teaching indigenous histories that you're better off not calling her Pocahontas. Right, yeah. that's useful. What should we be calling her? Matoaka or Amanute. Right. How do I spell that? M a t o a k a. Now this discussion has gone back and forth because she has different names at different times, but her tribal descendants, who are the people who I would tend to trust on this subject, say that Pocahontas is a sort of private name, um, one that is she's given by her family, and so she becomes known by it later, but that it's culturally insensitive to call her that. Um, Amanute is another name, A M. O-N-U-T-E, that she goes by. Now, of course, some historians have said, well, there's no evidence in the early sources that Pocahontas was a private name. But if her descendant community say, we would prefer you didn't use this, then that's how, I, you know, which doesn't mean you can't say better known it's, it's as. Uh, yeah. Although she doesn't appear, except in passing in my book, partly because she's just after the period I'm doing, but also because her descendant community have actually said, could you please stop talking about her? Um, not, which sounds kind of basic, it kind of unreasonable in a, in a historiographical sense, except what they mean is that her story has been told and retold and appropriated so many times and done wrong and done badly. 
And in their tellings of the story, in their histories, she is a child who is kidnapped and mm. sexually abused, essentially. Mm. It's not this Disney fairy tale. Mm. Now, of course, that does you know, that doesn't mean as historians we should never talk about her. Um, but I think being very aware of the sensitivities there, because she's an indigenous woman who was so appropriated and whose story has been mistold so often mm. is really worth thinking about. It can, of course, yeah. be a, a, something accessible for children. Like you've seen Pocahontas, you know, the film. They've seen it. and But actually talking to them about how she is being represented and what that mm. might tell us about how indigenous people's histories have been mistold is one of the most important things about it I think. It almost strikes me that that's the more interesting and useful part of that actually isn't it is mm. the opportunity there to talk about in a kind of decolonized way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's really useful. Um, but, yeah, how, Paul, Paul Thrush's book, I should just say, for anybody who hasn't come across it, has like walking tours of Indigenous London in it. And he's much braver than me. He writes this kind of poetry that combines primary sources with f imaginative fiction. It deserved to be much, much more widely uh, advertised, I think, over here. But he doesn't just talk about Indigenous uh, Americans. He's talking about... Uh, or about the just about the period I'm talking about. He he talks about mm. indigenous peoples from all across the globe coming to London over time, yeah. um, right up to the 20th century. Yeah, and the stuff around all the th all the kind of theatre performers and, and mm. yeah, it's it's such a rich narrative. It's, it's yeah. if you haven't read it, it's really good. Go out and read it. I like um, Paul's friend. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, his book's fantastic. So please thank him from us. <laughs> The, uh, there's been lots of questions coming in in the chat, and Sarah, I'm conscious that you you asked your question first, but it may be a, bit, be a departure from what we're talking on about right now. So we will come back to it, I promise. Um, but Johnny, hi Johnny, I hope you're well, um, has actually given us a kind of string of three questions that lead quite nicely um, into what you've just been talking about. Um, so I, I wonder if we start with Johnny's first question, actually. Um, could you say a bit more? Um, about how we can see the, this kind of Mexico, or I guess the diaspora of, of indigenous people that you talk about in your book, how can we see them as part of this kind of broader connected world? That, that, that is a big question. I, can, I kind of want Johnny to explain more what they, because of course that could be a man or woman, is, yeah. are getting at. Um, Shall we park that then? Do you, do you mind if we come back to that one? Because it's yeah. such, I could just ramble about that for some time. Cool. Um, Johnny, if mind you Johnny refine... just explaining a little bit more about what you were getting at. Yeah. Um, if you could refine your question a bit and just type that in the Q&A for us, that would be grand. And then we'll come back to it. Um, maybe if we come to the next two questions then. Yeah. Um, what do you think are the key things teachers should have in mind when teaching Indigenous histories and and I guess kind of here what Johnny's really getting at is and I suppose we were just talking about this with Pocahontas mm. um, or uh, Mata, Mata Oka is that how Matoaka. I pronounce it? Matoaka. So, Matoaka. 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 thank you um what traps or mistakes really Johnny is asking could we or should we be avoiding when we're teaching indigenous histories I would just preface this by saying that I think there's a fear of not teaching of of offending people and so not teaching the history and I, and I don't think that's the way forward and I hope that when the book is out one of the things I'd like to do is to try and think about producing some more teacher resources and things like um they've done for um uh kind of a black histories in Britain for uh, for Tudor Tudor the, in particular Miranda Kaufman I think has been involved with with a project doing um, Black Tudors, hasn't she? And, and it would be quite nice to, to produce some things that would be useful here. So I, I think the important thing for me, and this is what I tell my students, because I teach a master's module on this, uh, on studying Indigenous histories, essentially, in colonial contexts, which is using Mexico as a case study, but trying to think about those bigger questions. And I think the most important thing is just being thoughtful and sensitive about it. So being aware of the language that you're using and not using that language carelessly and trying to find out 
how those Indigenous people would have referred to themselves rather than making assumptions about it. Um, so, for example, Johnny's uh, third question is about talking about Indigenous people rather than natives. Now, you might have noticed that I do use the word native people uh, or native peoples, and it's because um, I think, and we in the US, they don't feel this as strongly as we do from talking to a, a native friend in the US. Um, in the UK, we have a kind of imperial tradition in people in which people used phrases like the natives are restless. And it was a way of dehumanizing people as part of a collective group of subordinated people. Uh, and so using that term carelessly to someone who studies indigenous histories like me feels like when people saw, talk about the blacks do X or Y, it just feels really dehumanizing and, and just ick and awful. Now, some scholars in the US do use all of these terms and they still make me feel ick, um, but obviously different conventions do apply in different places. Now, indigenous people say the terms we call ourselves are the ones that we, you know, we prefer you use the, the words that we use for ourselves or used for ourselves. We don't always have those words. They haven't always survived. We don't always know. So like in my sources, I might have someone who's just recorded as a Mexican uh, Indio, it put Indian. And so I can't use the correct term for them. Now, indigenous is almost, there are with very slight exceptions, it's almost the only neutral term. You know, it's one that nobody objects to. Um, there's a, I've got a three page introduction at the beginning of my book called Why Words Matter, where I try and explain the different terms and why they matter. Native American, so Indian is still used in the United States because it has legal currency. So it's what people are called in treaties, for example, is Indians. And some of the large organizations like the American Indian Association uh, were uh, sorry, American Indian movement were used Indian. That said, it has mostly been rejected because it's a European imposition. They weren't Indians. You know, Columbus used it because he thought they were in India. They're not in India. So there are still plenty of indigenous peoples in America who call themselves Indian, but it's not for me unless they say, I prefer you call me this. It's not for me to use that term, which is anachronistic. Um, Native American was popular for a while among scholars, but it has uh, a couple of problems. One is that it, it excludes people who aren't met, see, don't see themselves as Americans, in which tends to apply to the United States. And it also suggests that America predated the arrival of Europeans, which of course it didn't. <laughs> America is a Eurocentric concept in and of itself. So that's a bit of a problem. I'm now rambling about this, but the point I'm trying to make is that it's not about always being right. It's about just being thoughtful in your use of language. And one of the most thoughtful things you can do is to talk about indigenous peoples instead of indigenous people, because there are many of them, many different cultures, many different communities. Similarly, there are many indigenous histories, not just one. And so being aware of that diversity, I think is really important, diversity among within groups as well as of groups um, and just foregrounding that sensitivity I think would be the first thing as a, as a teacher that I do and trying to undermine stereotypes, trying to get away from this idea that Indigenous peoples are um, the, the other big stereotype that a lot of Indigenous peoples have faced is um, this idea that they're of the past, that they're not living cultures today. They're um, created as a, a sort of fossilized artifact. These people who are um, uh, wearing traditional clothing, living uh, in, in teepees or, um, you know, longhouses or whatever it is, depending on where you are, that, that they're of the past, not of the present. There's a good book called Indians in Unexpected Places that takes on those stereotypes. Um, and so 
reminding people I've been involved with a number of children's books and the one thing I always make sure they're doing is saying that these are living cultures there are a million people who still speak Nahuatl, the Aztec language in Mexico today, to differing levels of ability, but still a million people. There are six million or more Maya people in Central America. These are not societies that were annihilated or wiped out, you know? They have descendants, and it matters that we listen to those descendants because of how oppressed they've been. I mean, up until the 1970s, it was illegal to use indigenous languages or practice indigenous religions in Canada, you know, very recently. And so just being aware of those sensitivities, I think needs to be central, um, which doesn't like give you tools to go into the classroom, but it it's the mindset, I think, and getting the kids to, or, or young adults in many cases to have that mindset, to just be thinking a little bit about, okay, so the so if you're even working with primary school children, I've done stuff with primary school children, um, and you just, you're saying, so look, here's a picture of their descendants, you know, these are their kids going to school, they're like, you know, with their mobile phones or whatever, it's, this is their history, it just sets it up in a different way to, ooh, look, here's a picture of a temple. Aren't they weird? And, the, and of course, children and adults, it has to be said, are very interested in human sacrifice because it seems really weird. I mean, pe people are fascinated by violence um, in lots of contexts. And I mean, you have no idea how many invitations I get that say, you can talk about anything you'd like, but would you talk about human sacrifice if you don't mind that'd be nice <laughs> and that yeah I get it it's yeah it's fascinating I wrote a book about it I've written articles about it I think it's really fascinating um but just being you know just flipping the script a little bit because it's not like people are still practicing human sacrifice in Mexico today there are some horrifying cases actually in India and occasionally in Africa uh, where there has been human sacrifice. There's one I keep, I have a news alert for human sacrifice uh, and you get some weird stuff, but uh, I've been getting a lot of articles um, from a case where uh, two women were sacrificed and buried under a house and were in the, in the back garden of a house, sorry. And people keep going, it's like a tourist attraction now. People are going to see what happened at the house. So that voyeurism is, you know, people watching this, what was the Netflix, the Jeffrey Dahmer thing on Netflix, which his, the victims, the families of the victims who were copied in it said was hideous. So I didn't, I didn't watch it, but I understand. Yeah. As people, as humans, we're fascinated by things that seem strange. So it's not recognizing that things are different. I don't think, or that even that they might be fascinating because of that, but removing that sense that they're somehow not like us and that's what my first book was really about was was like no actually people like us can do these things they do do these things i mean lots of people kill and die for religion now it's it's not that unusual yeah and that's interesting i mean obviously you invoke you invoke the Nazis and you've lost the argument, right? But, uh, that, you know, in many ways, there's interesting parallels. I think, you know, what you were just talking about there makes me, maybe this just speaks of how I've been a teacher for too long. Therefore, I've taught about Nazi Germany every year for mm -hmm. uh, about 50 million years. Um, but it strikes me that there are certainly parallels there with kind of Goldhagen and, you know, willing executioners. Yeah. It's the Although, other way around, isn't it? But, I instantly... Yeah was to go because people when people compare the Aztecs to the Nazis and it is one of those right, things yeah, where I, yeah, I've yeah. joked it's like that what whatever that rule is that the longer you have a conversation on the internet the more likely it is someone will mention yeah. the Nazis the same is true of the Aztecs if you have if you talk to somebody for long enough it becomes increasingly likely they'll compare them to the Nazis. <laughs> sorry and then people start uh, talking use, using phrases like I was I was a consultant on a tv program and they, after I consulted on the script, they wanted me to be a talking head in it. And I said, I wouldn't do it because they ignored all my advice. And it used phrases like killing on an industrial scale, which is just. Which it isn't. 
and also it's not the motivations for it aren't comparable mm. to the, the Nazis. It isn't alienating. It's not racist. It's not yeah. a, intended to subject people. It is exclusively that they believe. I mean, there there are obviously some socio-political things entangled with it, but they're doing it because they believe the world will end if they don't mm. sacrifice people. So for me, a closer parallel is martyrdom. You mm. give your life for the gods and you get a privileged afterlife as a result of giving your life to the gods. So most Aztecs after death go to a kind of horrible place where if you die as a sacrifice, you're one of the few people who gets to avoid that. And mm. you go to this nice afterlife. Um, and so now, of course, there's a question about how willing the people are when they're going to be sacrificed. Are they really willing or just idealized as willing and the sources what limited sources there are on consent suggest it's exactly as you'd expect some people go willingly and some people are dragged kicking and screaming and that's what it's like to idealize death uh, you know it's it's all very well to say yes i will die for the gods and it's another thing to do it um i, I would also say that the aztecs themselves um who we should clarify in fact are the mexica people uh, they would not have used the word Aztec. That's an 18th century word. So I should just be clear. I use Aztec because then people know who I'm talking about. But actually, they would have called themselves the Mexica, which is spelt like Mexico, but with an A on the end. They, um, they, their whole culture was set up to idealize the idea, not just of capturing people, but of dying as a sacrifice. So the expectation of their warriors, and even it's supposed to be their ideal death, was that they would go off and be sacrificed in other cities. That was what they were trying to achieve. So it, it's a reciprocal violence, which is why it doesn't, for me, fit very well with the Nazis. Although there are, of course, things there that you could talk about, about the normalization of violence and, and making it you know, usual and acceptable. But it, it's also a society where you're supposed to accept that violence could and maybe should happen to you as the ideal death which is obviously very very different yeah and in many ways and again this might be completely wrong so please correct me if i'm wrong but so we teach the vikings at gcse and there's a particular area of interest in my, of mine and obviously there are there are things that are very different but in in some ways it's not dissimilar from the kind of you know that sort of psyche switch from you know the vikings and the the the, the inherent need for for violence in order to reach the very top of viking heaven as it were in, in valhalla yeah. you know if you if you i don't know vikings, very much about the vikings yeah so i am so, not gonna wander into this <laughs> conversation on a recorded youtube video where i'm like yeah the vikings no i don't yeah you really know but yes uh yeah it, it, you're supposed to idealize a warrior death definitely mm -hmm. which is um, something that happens in in a, quite a few societies across mm. history, isn't it? Um, it's interesting. Uh, and and actually, I have an article that I mentioned because it's open access and you can get it for free on the internet. Uh, if you just put in my name and a warlike society, it should come up. And it's all about how Aztec culture creates itself really consciously, consciously as a society of warriors, including women who are supposed to. Um, they're, they have a parallel afterlife to men. There's a lot of detail there that I could go into, which makes it slightly different, but I won't, I won't do that now. <laughs> um, unless people, you know, ask about it, just take my word for it. There's a parallel afterlife and women who die in childbirth get the parallel afterlife to men who die in wow. battle or as a sacrifice. And the women who die in childbirth are talked about as having captured a baby, buried, uh, sorry, um, carried the small shield. They participate in rituals that are intended to ensure that the husbands have success on the battlefield all of this kind of thing so the whole society is entangled with success in war and so and associated with that success in feeding the gods and making sure the world doesn't end so um there's a uh what's the word yeah the it's it's a it's not just the men it's a whole societal thing and yeah mm. the article is open access so you can get it online if you like yeah that's uh, really that would be helpful to anyone somebody said they missed the first 40 minutes of the 
um, in the chat that they missed the first 40 minutes, I am reliably informed this will be on the YouTube channel. So you can watch it. Yeah, absolutely. It might be um, it might be a few weeks at least until we manage to edit it and get it up because we are. When? Eventually. Just, um, but eventually it will be. Um, that Sarah, I promise we will get to your question earlier oh, on. And Johnny clarified that... his question, didn't he? Yes, he did actually. Um, yeah. Aztecs pre night 1590. Oh, I see. Okay. So I uh, had quite considerable arguments with people as part of the Global Middle Ages project about whether we were ending the project before or after 1492. Because if you do end it before 1492, you, it's harder to talk about the Americas as part of a connected world than if you let it go on to, say, 1519. Um, that said, uh, for me, there, there were a couple of ways that were really important for thinking about indigenous peoples, the Americas, as part of a, a global connected world. One is to stop seeing Europe as the center of that connected world, or Eurasia and Africa as the center. So the Americas has its own long distance trading networks and communication networks, for example, quite considerable ones that stretch all across North America, all across uh, the Yucatan and Central America, big long distance trading networks. Now, people see globalization as a process whereby Eurasian and African networks stretch out like this. For me, I, I argued that you should see them as kind of it, it's networks connecting. And so it's it's their networks form part of those foundations. People talk about proto globalization, you know, early globalization. It, things like the Silk Roads. Why aren't we talking about long distance trade in the Americas? It's over comparable distances, but nobody's calling that proto globalization, even though it stretches across states, for want of a better word, indigenous polities, you know? So that's one way of doing it. Another is um, to think in terms of, so I, again, I wrote an article that is open access with my colleague uh, Amanda Power, where we talk, tried to flip the idea of the global, which at the moment tends to be understood in terms of connections. So globalization for us is entangled with, all, with modernity. It's about being modern, being global is being modern. And it's very hard to disentangle those narratives in the historiography. You know, it, when I looked up Me the history of Mexico and the history of globalization, nearly all of the histories were about how, um, Mexico had been left behind in globalization, wasn't globalized enough, these kinds of things. And so Amanda and I wrote about a thing called globalizing cosmologies, which was just to summarize really briefly, is about starting thinking of places in terms of their worldview. And the Aztecs, among other cultures, all societies have a worldview. For us, it was about moments in time when societies were operating in a global way really consciously engaging with the wider world. And the Aztecs were doing that during their expansion. They had this idea of creating an empire from sea to sea. They engaged with the ocean. Um, if you wanted to do actual connect, and so I could go on about that for ages, so I will not, but it's a, you know, it's about flipping the idea of the global and thinking about global perspectives as something that comes from within rather than being imposed by necessarily networks. Um, there is a book called The Year 1000 written by Valerie Hansen, which if you want to do actual connective histories, talks about the evidence for previous connections with the Americas, not the Aztecs, but the, uh, so the, you know, the Vikings in what is now Canada in Los Amedo, for example. Um, but she has a lot of stuff about the Maya, which I strongly disagree with. Um, because there's all there's these freezes which some people have said oh look they feature blonde haired people and it does honestly it, I, I don't know any Maya scholars who would hold up the analysis in it it's it's um and she and I actually met and talked about it and she was amazing she wrote a, a note a thank you to me in the end note somewhere which says something like that I suggested radical changes to the analysis <laughs> which but you know but if you're but it's a very interesting book does a good job of comparing the year 1000 connecting places um but you 
might want to read uh, Mayanist reviews of that bit before using it in teaching, let's say. Mm. Uh, there's actually there's a really interesting book as well that you might find interesting for teaching with uh, GCSE A level students called Civilization, and it's by this is really bad. I was on the radio with him. Uh, I'm going to look it up now. Um, it was all, it was start the week, and the book was called Civilizations, and he's French. And I just, uh, uh, um, Laurent Binet, who wrote K uh, KKK, that some of you might have, KKK? I think it is KKK, uh, that some of you might have read. And um, he tells the story of HHH, not KKK. It's a different letter, HHH, um, about, um, no, I'm not going to say what it's about because I'll get that wrong as well. Uh, but that was a good book, though. Um, very popular with historians. But Civilizations takes the idea, what if the Vikings, instead of going and then leaving, had gone and stayed? And so from as early as 1000, uh, European diseases and technologies are his big ones had become embedded in the Americas. Uh, and then the idea is that then the Incas managed to colonize Europe and it's and it's written in the style of historical sources as well so he combines some actual bits of Columbus's diaries and of the Viking sagas and things and he, it's written in the style of these historical sources a range of historical it's kind of cool um I think it's a little bit Jared Diamond for me which if you've read Guns, Germs and Steel you'll know what I'm talking about it's all a little bit material factors drive everything um and funnily enough, he said to me that he'd just been reading Jared Diamond when he was writing the book. Uh, but it is it is really interesting on that. Like, what if instead of um, European farming methods destroying indigenous ways of farming, the Incas had taken their farming methods that they use in the mountains and had used them to transform parts of Europe that are considered not very fertile places to farm? And I was like, oh, yeah, that's really so. Yeah, it is. It's a good it's an interesting it's an interesting book if you want to do a little bit of counterfactual thinking with students that's kind of cool is that the kind of tiered farms that, yeah the, the yeah. terraces yeah. yeah yeah which are amazing yeah. um we, we must go to sarah's question so um if i ask sarah's question and then janice we've had a couple of questions from great questions from danielle so once um caroline's finished answering those if 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 you ask um, those, that'd be grand. Um, so Sarah's question right at the top was, um, which sources would you suggest that we look at to try and best understand the Aztecs? And, and I guess kind of within that as well, which sources, my own question, um, which sources might you recommend we use in the classroom? I don't know if you've had ones mm. um, or used ones with primary students that have worked particularly well. Um, so yeah, some information on sources, please, would be great. So the first thing I'm going to do, and I was going to do this at some point, I might as well do it now, is to recommend to everybody a website called Mexicolor, Mexicolor, um, spelt but spelt Mexico, L-O-R-E. Let me check if that's right. M-E-X-I-C-O-L-O-R-E dot co dot UK. This is a group run by Ian and Graciela. It's a company. They go into um, if schools and do workshops with schools uh, and they do and they've done they do amazing stuff I did a workshop with them at the British Museum but that I recommend them not to recommend their workshops although they are fabulous but because they have amazing Aztec and Maya resource pages now the website and you'll see if you go to their website you'll see on the left hand side at the bottom of the menu Aztec pages and Maya pages now the website is a little bit busy uh, just because there's so much stuff there but they have teaching resources they have outlines of everything you could think of from really recent scholarship to kind of basic introductory stuff for primary school kids the the quality of the content is so good that I recommend this to my students this is where if I want the answer to a really simple question about something about the Aztecs this is where I will look it up uh, so use the search bar <laughs> judiciously but you'll find it's all sourced so where they've used stuff from my book they've said you know 
they have something about marriage i think and a, a little article they've done about marriage that was sourced from my book and they put it there they've got articles written by experts that talk about key issues um and then they have um basic resources as well on everything you could possibly want so you need to spend a little bit of time kind of going through it but there is so much stuff there you could plan a lesson on anything based on what they've got there without having to go anywhere else really um and it's it's amazing super useful um and they talk about some of the sources uh, and are very good about listing their sources and also depicting sources so for anyone who doesn't know the difficulty is oh and johnny knew it was binet as well and, and i forgot uh for anybody who doesn't know um the uh difficulty with sources for the aztec mexica people specifically so the people of tenochtitlan is that although they had a very rich pictographic and oral culture, the Spanish destroy all of the pictographic sources. They think they might be corrupting and religious, so they destroy everything with the conquest. There are about 13 documents, I say about because some of them are contested, for all of Mexico that predate the invasion for central Mexico. These are the pictographic sources. There are then, so what we're reliant on is pictographic sources created after the invasion, uh, accounts of missionaries um, and conquistadors and then from about 56 years starting after the, the conquest accounts by the descendants of indigenous people who are often mestizo who are an elite and starting to tell those histories uh, for a, a mixed indigenous and spanish audience there are some anonymous town accounts but most of them aren't available in english is the trouble um and then there's there's pictographic sources. The difficulty you might have is with translation into English with some stuff and also with availability. A lot of it's not available online uh, or has quite um, restrictive uh, rules around um, copyright, unhelpfully. So my starting point though would be the Florentine Codex. And I was incredibly excited to discover in a seminar this week that it's all been digitized and put online. Uh, and I'm just checking that I've not got this wrong, but it's, oh, where is it? Well, I put, what did I put in? Book 12, I put in. I was trying to get pictures for my students. Uh, and I put in something like the World History Library where they used to have all of the, um, uh, picture they used to have all the original images but they didn't have a translation but now there is an online version at the very least of book 12 and it's it's uh stephanie wood's project that have it enl.oregon there's book 12 so book 12 so the florentine codex what i'm talking about is a book written by uh it's compiled by Bernardino de Sacon, who's a Franciscan friar, who goes around and interviews hundreds of indigenous people about their past. And it's 12 volumes, and the first 11 are all about indigenous culture. The 12th one, which it looks like is the one that's available online, is, um, let me just see if one of the other books is available online. Uh, I'm just changing the url to see if it's there no it's just book 12 book 12 is the one that's all about the invasion so you can now get all the pictures with the parallel spanish and nahuatl and english text all down underneath um and the text and it is an amazing source um oh debbie says there's an interesting teaching pack with sources available if you google what do the buried secrets of tenochtitlan tell us about the aztecs i'm wondering um how good it is um could, could you put the the link that you've got could you copy it and paste oh, the link for the that? florentine codex yeah. is he's asking but it would also be good to have the other link for the the what do, um hang on i'll put the florentine codex link if yeah you... that'd be brilliant just copy and paste it in the chat that'd be great um johnny's just asked for it as well but yes. that sounds copy fascinating that. that's the florentine codex link and there are other sources there as well in the early nahuatl library if you um click at the top They've got resources there. Um, in terms of resources that are 
available another thing i would suggest and i'll put i'll put the name in the chat is called the lienzo de clash carla now this is a really interesting one for teaching with because it's from the point of view of the allies of the spanish during the conquest so these are the clash carlans who uh have been fighting with the aztecs for decades and the spanish arrive and they resist them to start with and then they go hang on a minute maybe we could use these people uh to win our war and they ally with them and um they fight with the spanish actually by the it's mostly clash carlins who do the fighting there's tens of thousands of clash carlins who are involved and only a few hundred spaniards and all and they in uh the 1540s and 50s we don't have an exact date they draw a big canvas of their history and their involvement in the conquest in pictographic form with just a few words on and that's all available online and you with nice histories and background and you can get it and analyze it and, and look at it in terms of aztec society itself before the invasion i would suggest trying to use some material culture if you can objects can be really really illuminating and as i say on the mexico law website if you were to look up say midwives they every page is beautifully illustrated with objects and it tells you what they are so you can use their illustrations frequently with appropriate uh, credit and so on um but they also have um there's also the other thing that i think is is great to use with students is a thing called the codex mendoza and this is available um the entire original thing is available online the codex mendoza for free uh, on um, wiki commons but there is a an essential codex mendoza which is a paperback it's a big a4 ish paperback which has all of the translations and transcriptions in it and the codex mendoza is fantastic because if you've seen that picture of the eagle standing on the cactus at the cross of the waters like that that's from the codex mendoza and the third part of the Codex Mendoza, people often know about the tribute roles and things, but the third part of the Codex Mendoza is a history of the Aztecs, of their lives with pictures. So it says, for example, uh, when you're, um, uh, like, this is what you do when you're one, this is what you do when you're two, and it shows the upbringing with the parents. It also has... Uh, a, a nice image with accompanying text of the uh, Moctezumas of the power pyramid and what the palace is like and who can go where things like this so it's and they, they have pages showing all of the lots of different jobs that people can do uh, lots of different roles be cautious because what we think is that the text the, the images were probably produced by indigenous artists but then the text is glossed by Spaniards, so the text probably isn't as accurate, but is useful. It would be really wonderfully used alongside the Florentine Codex, which is late and has the problems that it is um, an elite male perspective, because that's who most of the informants were. But it is a, he, there's a reason Bernardino de Sagun has been called the first anthropologist. He seems to really care about just collecting information about these people's lives. That doesn't mean he may not have misunderstood or that people may have deliberately misrepresented their society to him. But the Florentine Codex has two versions, an Nahuatl and a Spanish. And one of the ways that we or we seem fairly uh, confident, yeah, the, it says Wired Humanities is the Florentine Codex link, Alan. Um, it's the one that starts HTTPS wide humanities just above the ends of day clash Carla. So I'm answering it. chat thing. One of the reasons we can be really reasonably confident that um, the Florentine Codex is representing at least what Bernardino de Sahagun thinks is true, which is, of course, a different thing to it being true, um, is that there are two versions, Nahuatl and Spanish. And there are things in the Nahuatl version that aren't in the Spanish version. So in the Nahuatl, for example, there are two main things he kinds of things he omits. One is things he thinks might be corrupting, so like prayers. But he still records them, kind of keeps them for posterity. The other is things he thinks might be boring for people. So in the uh, Spanish version, for example, the Nahuatl version, there's a long section about chopping down trees. And in the Spanish version, it just says, of course, everybody knows how to chop down trees. But he still wrote it down. 
I don't know. Oh, hang on. Everything I've put in the chat is not going to everybody. I'll I'll repost it now. Don't I worry. Will. I'll put them in now. Sorry. Um, this is what comes of trying to talk and look at screens and chat at the same time. So the Florentine Codex um, and the introduction to my Bonds of Blood book talks briefly about different sources that are available. And you can um you can get that free, I think, as part of the preview online if you want to. Um, you know, there's a, the publisher has a, a, a preview bit, and I think that bit is part of the preview, so you can you can read that. Um, the Florentine Codex, although it's late, is is a really amazing source. The Codex Mendoza would work really well alongside it, and then there are some specific things like one thing that I use that works really well with students is in Diego Duran. Um, he has a law code that talks about what people are and are not allowed to do. And it so beautifully encapsulates what Aztec society is like. Um, it, it, it's a very, very military society. And that comes through, you know, they're obsessed with what people are allowed to wear and that everybody behaves the way they're supposed to behave. It feels like, like the rules for an army, you know? It's all about visible status and doing what you're told uh, and so on and so forth. And so I think that law code specifically, which is in uh, the book is called, let me just write it so people can see it. Diego Duran, the history of the Indies, Indies of New Spain um, is, is actually a really great teaching resource just by itself. Um, there are probably lots of other sources, but I haven't actually mentioned that many. <laughs> I don't think just gone on about three of them. Uh, yeah. They sound incredibly rich, though. Um, yeah, yeah, they are rich. You have to be careful because they're all being created after the conquest, though. So just students need to yeah. be a little bit cautious, you know, cautious with them. But you can have that conversation with students, like what might that mean for how we're seeing this image of the history? Mm. Yeah, um, I'm conscious of time and don't want to keep you forever. So I'm wondering if, uh, Janice, do you want to ask one of Danielle's questions and then maybe if we finish off with Johnny's last question as well? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a kind of common theme coming from, from both Danielle's and Johnny's questions. So I'm going to, if that's okay, kind of merge them because I think they kind of centre on the same sort of thing. Um, so Danielle said um, that she's Me Mexican-British and grew up uh, with Aztecs equals human sacrifice what aspects of Mexican culture should we focus on instead? And then Johnny has kind of asked a similar question along this um, idea of uh, um, how important do you think it is to explore with pupils the idea that Aztecs believe in the Spanish were gods? So I suppose both questions are kind of centered around this idea of how do we teach this important history without kind of tokenizing it or maybe reinforcing students' misconceptions? Um, yeah. yeah. And yeah, I think that's really important. Um, somewhere is um, uh, oh, uh, you can get the material culture on Mexico law as well, Emmy. Um, the what I was the thing is, I one thing I would say is really great to talk to students about outside of human sacrifice is the fact that the Aztecs. And as far as I know, though, please tell me if anybody knows of another example, they're the only pre-modern culture where this is true. They have a universal education system. All boys and all girls go to school. They go to different kinds of school. Uh, so boys and girls both seem to go to some kind of craft schools, but also um, they, and, and then the boys go to warrior schools and priestly schools, but all boys and all girls go to a thing called the Kuikakali, the House of Song, uh, it, when they're teenagers to learn history, rhetoric, laws. This is a society where they're making sure everybody knows why they're doing what they're doing. It's not like Catholic Europe, where the fact it's in Latin and a bit mysterious is part of the point. Everybody's supposed to understand why they're doing what they're doing. And so I think that can really be a way in. You know, how does it make a difference to a society that everybody understands that they're why they're supposed to be committing human sacrifice? You know, it's not just a, oh, go out and kill people. It's, well, do you know the world is going to end if you don't do that? And then you can also talk about socially 
what the schools might allow. So if you live in quite a structured society, but every evening when you're a teenager, you're picked up the men, the boys by a male teacher and the girls by a female teacher, and you're taken somewhere and taught, but then you get together to sing and dance afterwards. Like what, how, what they might they be doing during that time? It's clearly not just purely education, is it? There's, there's other stuff going on there. They love their kids gender equality i think is a huge one that 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 you know is really relevant and and if we teach about it it's it's a really good way in to thinking about them as a different kind of society i mentioned some of the stuff around gender equality at the start i think i wrote an article for uh the bbc world histories magazine that is about flipping the script on the aztecs as B so if you had have, have that at school or anything it's a um or have subscriptions it, it was about when they found that big tower of skulls in Mexico City, I, I, there were lots of sensationalist stereotypes around it. And I wrote about all the other things that we might set against it, like the fact that they love poetry and flowers and, and so on. The You're Dead to Me podcast, which some of you might know, also doesn't focus on human sacrifice. It talks about lots of other things. Um, and I think a lot of teenagers especially really enjoy that. Um, it's got, um, I should know what his name is because he's, he's famous. The comedian who, who hosts the masked singer and i keep forgetting his i shouldn't put this on the internet should i should just say my friend uh greg jenner no not greg who hosts it, oh, the, comedian, hosts it. the comedian is oh um masked singer. Uh, blah, blah, blah. michael mcintyre no oh no, that, that's the someone weird. said joel oh, domert in the chat joel domert thank no. you uh and he's obviously very popular although not sufficiently popular on the kind of television that I watch for me to have remembered what he was called, uh, which makes it sound like I watch very highbrow television, which is a lie. He just doesn't feature on Disney Plus that much. Um, right. Uh, so coming back round, I, I think both of those are a good place because I don't want to just describe everything to get um, ideas for things you could use. If you want this in a more long form, this is basically what my book is about, my first book, and you can get that in paperback. Um, so it's 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 not just a hyper, hyper expensive academic one. Um, but like I say, it's quite a bit of it I've done on the podcast and in also in some podcasts I did for, um, I did a, a long podcast that with Susanna Lipscomb on her Not Just the Tudors podcast where she took the time to talk about all kinds of things over a longer form, which is a bit more scholarly, but you might get a lot out of it that you could use, which isn't to say students couldn't listen to it, but they probably would enjoy your dead to me more. Um, I, I like your dead to me. Um, the thing about exploring narratives. Now, the famous idea is that Cortez arrives Moctezuma has seen omens and is terrified and the Spanish and believes the Spanish are gods. And the problem is this has been perpetuated by a famous book called The Broken Spears, which you may well have seen because it is the cheapest, most accessible collection of primary source material for the conquest. The trouble is that what Miguel Leon Portilla, who was a great doyen, a do is doyen a woman thing? I think that might be a female, whatever the male equivalent of a doyen is, is it maybe doyen's male. I don't know. Anyway, a grandee of Nahuatl uh, and Aztec history. He um, took these pieces in the 50s originally, but it's been, there are like 17 editions or something now. He took all these bits of primary sources and put them together into what he called the um, Aztec view of the conquest. The trouble is, that the view he presents is the view from the Florentine Codex, which presents this idea that the Spanish arrive and Moctezuma is terrified and the Aztecs are believed to be gods. Now, uh, Johnny is right. Uh, the best place to deconstruct this is, a, is an article by Camilla Townsend called Burying the White Gods. It You can get it on Google. If you Google it, it is a big enough article that you will find places people have put it. Um, and it's on JSTOR, I think, as well. Now, I, it has been pretty, I think most people would say that it's been debunked, this idea, or at least it's deeply problematic. And the, the reason is that um, 
the idea that Cortez is believed to be Quetzalcoatl appears for the first time in the Florentine, the, that full story of it appears for the first time in the Florentine Codex. No one even suggests they might have been believed to be gods until um, after, about 20 years after. And so what seems to have happened, now there are some, that's not to say, and other some historians have made this case, that the Aztecs didn't necessarily have a belief that Quetzalcoatl, the returned god, might have come. And 1519 is an important year. And there probably were omens, like the comet, and they would have seen a comet and thought, oh, I wonder what that is. It's just that at the time they didn't think, oh, well, our society is about to fall. What happens, it seems, is that in the 50 years after the invasion, indigenous peoples combined with Spaniards, so the Spanish loved the idea that they were believed to be gods, love it. We were believed to be gods. You see white people going all over the world, all through history. Oh, they believed us to be gods. There's a one of those, um, there's a cartoon where there's these enormous legs like this. Um, oh, I forget the name of the people who do the, Larson, one of the Larson cartoons is big legs like this and there's a bush and there's some little men in pith helmets in the bush and the um, caption is, perhaps if we're lucky, they will believe us to be gods. And it's because it's such a trope. It's all over the world. I see it all the time. But so the, the Spanish are very keen that they were believed to be gods. Even if they did think there was something divine about them, and it is possible they, they thought they were otherworldly, they quite quickly realized they are men. I mean, Cortez's letter literally, which is one of only two contemporary sources, to the conquest, literally has Moctezuma saying, can't you see I am a man just like you? <laughs> um, you know, it's, yeah. Which doesn't mean they weren't scared of the guns to begin with, the few guns they did have. They actually, it seems like the horses, they, they thought the horses were really impressive because the horses never turned away. They thought the horses might be some kind of demonic or, or spiritual force um, because they'd never seen horses. Anyway. What I'm working up to is that the indigenous people at the same time, who do have a cyclical view of history, they do understand that things come around again and that omens exist and that the world is um, repeating patterns. They're during this period trying to understand what happened to them. How did we go from this huge, amazing empire to being defeated so quickly? And so it seems like in combination with Spanish superiority, they start to tell a story that rationalizes what happened to them. And so this is an indigenous view of the conquest. It's just not what they thought was happening at the time, I think is the point. Um, but it is what their descendants believe happened 50 years later. Now, I think it actually is OK to open this with I mean, it, we don't I don't know what age the pupils are, secondary school pupils as long. And I think even I would say to primary school pupils, as long as you say it's a myth, if you open with. The myth that the Spanish were believed to be gods arrives 50 years after the conquest, and then you work back like I did to why. It's kind of a cool and interesting way to understand the Aztecs and how they think about things and why we might think this um and and actually it doesn't mean it's not an indigenous point of view and this is where we come back to nuancing things people like to talk about an indigenous point of view but this is where i started there isn't one there are many and so it's not it's it's still an indigenous point of view it just doesn't happen to be the contemporary point of view probably the other big thing in this story by the way is that is what we call the scapegoating of Moctezuma. So what do you do if your everything collapses? You blame the guy in charge. And so the other thing this myth does is create the idea that Moctezuma was a very weak and ineffectual ruler because he believed them to be gods. So they're all, if only we'd resisted sooner and Moctezuma hadn't been busy cowering in a cave, afraid of the gods, we would have been fine. You know, it's a whole thing. So. It's actually kind of a, an interesting thing to get into. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, 
and and it's and I think it is important to because if you talk to someone I talked to someone today randomly at the studio and they were like oh Cortez was believed to be Quetzalcoatl wasn't he and I'm like yeah no but that's what people think uh and so actually teaching students it's not what was probably happening at the time is more interesting I think than pretending it didn't happen mm. but of course you could just not teach the conquest and teach what came before but you always have to deal with the conquest a bit because all the sources are after <laughs> so it's hard to completely ignore the line but you don't have to teach the narrative of the conquest yeah it's it's very interesting isn't it it's a kind of um and, and maybe this is because I'm absolutely no expert in Aztec history but um I keep on kind of trying to make connections and there are the more you kind of talk about it there are so many connections with us teaching the Vikings and it we're doing very similar things mm. we're kind of we have these people that have kind of been and a culture that has kind of been appropriated and almost kind of distilled to one thing the big hairy viking warrior with horns on his helmet which isn't even is is well obviously they didn't they have, have horned helmets helmet, i know but, that one yeah but it's but it's i an know answer. that one no horns yeah and but the people who what they're talking about is a very small group of, yeah. of people in the viking world and actually that's that those people have we know about those people because of christian sources yes who are written by the people who they are raiding mm. and actually that's one aspect of viking society whereas the rest of it is incredibly rich in a whole multitude of ways and it yeah, oh, which is right. Like the the other thing I know about the Vikings that I learned recently is that you're not supposed to give it a capital letter anymore. Did you know no. this? Well, it's a verb, technically. Yeah, that's no. a thing you do. It's like the debate about, well, it's it's not really a debate. We would tend now to talk about enslaved people rather than slaves because yeah. it's something that happens to you, not something you are. Yeah. Which doesn't mean the word is never correct in any context of course if you're talking about legal histories for example it's impossible to avoid but um it, yeah it's really it, we're back to this just being sensitive about where you mm. start right mm. yeah and actually it's, it struck me when you were talking that um that there's a, we we teach in in or we think as history teachers in inquiries and oh this would be a great inquiry but i think there is a really great inquiry in what you were talking about almost in you know how would the how would the Aztecs have described themselves? Um, you know how might they have described their society? Um, or equally, you know why have we? Where have these myths come from, and why do they exist? And exploring that might be very interesting. Please, um, please do not though do what someone recently that I heard about uh, just was going to do. They're teaching the Maya, I think, and their model that they said the ideal thing they thought would happen was that the kids would role play Maya society with some of them being the the enslaved people yeah and I was like mm. don't do that <laughs> yeah um I think mm, <laughs> no <laughs> yeah I think <laughs> yeah differently <laughs> yeah. Though, yeah, though there are, if you do teach uh younger um age kids one thing I really recommend is getting them to play the Mesoamerican ball game because it is just like volleyball but you can't use your hands and feet you have to use your elbows and your shoulders and your knees and things I mean it obviously wasn't exactly like volleyball you had to try and get the ball through a ring high up but you can play it across a line in the playground and it, and you can show them videos of people it's been revived people play the, the ball game today um so there are things you can definitely do i did a role-playing thing where we did um uh, a midwife what the, what a midwife would have done with a baby and actually that's a great thing to do as a, a starting point for teaching because male and female gender roles are laid down really clearly in it's in the florentine codex it's also in the codex mendoza they give them the appropriate gendered artifacts they give a little speech about what the role well big speech in the florentine codex about what the roles of men and women are you know it's gender roles being set from the beginning and so i did that when i did the british museum thing with um ian and gabriella uh, graciela sorry uh we um i pretended to be an aztec midwife and little kids were the midwives you know with the dolls and stuff but actually as a as an in, a starting point for inquiry mm. those rituals take you a long way about what the aztecs think about gender mm. but not all the way because you 
it, it takes you to domestic versus military and domestic for us implies sort of drudgery and householdness and it doesn't for the Aztecs it means yeah. something much more important so and it, it's really different so it, it yeah. takes you part it's it's the starting starting point for something really interesting I think that's a good place to to start social inquiry that's really powerful and I suppose it also kind of separates actually what you're saying there is life is incredibly important to these people and and in a way that you can kind of separate it from that myth can't you of the the, the sacrifice there's also even more parallels with the viking world in that we also encounter the same issue um with our students kind of because similarly the the life at home women are, in, are, are very important in the viking home in a way that actually gives them status because the home sounds like similar to what you're saying has a heightened sense of importance yeah. and also kind of significance in the viking world than it perhaps does today um so yeah, yeah that's part of it parallels. It's it's also that things like the fact that um, they don't have cash, they have, and one of the main currencies is cloth and women do the weaving. So they're mm. where the money comes from. Mm. Um, the idea, I've argued, the, the idea of the domestic in Aztec culture goes beyond the home and it, it means the community. So women also hold roles, for example, as marketplace overseers. Uh, and those are the people who provision the army, for example. So they have quite a lot of influence. The fact they can inherit equally, or they do inherit equally with men, is like a huge, obvious marker of, of influence. So although they don't tend to hold the highest political offices, they have a lot of tangible markers of influence, which changes that you can get a divorce in Aztec culture. So, yeah, the, the, yeah there's, there's quite a lot of stuff around that that... that some people have said, and, and if you want, you can get into the fact that there, for older students, that there are differences in the way people, historians have seen this. So I would say this is a complementary society where you have these uh, parallel roles. Other people have said, uh, most notably Cecilia Klein, that the reason they have these parallel roles is that they think gender is fluid. And so it needs pinning down. You have to pin it down really carefully otherwise people might escape from the wrong box you know get in the wrong boxes mm. and you don't want that um so that you know you there are there's all kinds of places you could go with that that are super interesting mm. yeah it sounds fascinating and i can't wait until your book comes out actually um <laughs> that that honestly was fantastic and, and i've learned so much as absolutely not a, a specialist in um in aztec history oh, um, i don't know about Vikings, so we're yeah, well, fair. Um, that I hope also uh, people who are more experts in Aztec history who are on the call, who, who teach it, have also learned something um, because I, I thought that was absolutely tour de force. So, so thank you so, so much um, for this evening and for all of your time. Um, I suppose all that's really left to say is everybody, please jump on and buy Caroline's book um, that's upcoming. Yes, it um, it's January, oh. isn't it? It is out in January. And if anybody, so uh, I uh, said at the beginning, this is uh, embarrassing, but if you find what I've been talking about useful, I would love to hear. You can, the university is obsessed with demonstrating that these kinds of things have impact, mm -hmm. which is a horrible government word, uh, which just means that like sometimes our research makes its way outside of the university and people use it. Uh, and I, do not at all want to do what they suggested, which is sending you all a questionnaire. Uh, but if you were moved to let me know if you did use some of what I'd suggested, that would be really cool. So, What's the best pay way for people to do that? Email. You cool. can get my email is publicly available. You can. Uh, I, should I say this on YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it is. I mean, it's on. It's a work email. I'm not. I'm not hiding it. It's my work email is available, and and I'm on Twitter for as long as Twitter lasts. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm I'm going down with the ship. Uh, so, uh, yeah. But but email. Um, and yeah, if you have follow up questions, I'm happy to to answer them. So do drop me an email. Brilliant. And they people would just go onto the University of Sheffield's website. Yeah. If you Google me, email. you'll get my university webpage and my email address is right on there or it's linked from my twitter bio brilliant i mean janice and i will certainly ping you an email um that but if, as many people as possible you. if you found tonight useful which i'm sure all of you have um if you could um ping caroline an email as well that would be fantastic or um, when you actually use it that'd be fine yeah um 
Brilliant. Yeah, do let me know if you have questions. Um, but thank you so, so much again for this evening. And thank you everybody for being here as well. We couldn't do this without without you uh, as well. So, so thank you everybody. Thank you for the invitation and thank you all for coming and talking to me. Um, it was really nice to, to be able to chat with people. <laughs>